didn't come on. You sure? Yeah. We're good. No. Um, you could do me a favor. Go in that room and see if the third computer to your right is on. Just press it on. It'll come on. The lights will come on. Pardon me? There we go. Never mind, Sam. Okay. All right. Now that we had two minutes of crazy air time... Um, I'd love you to turn to your Bibles this morning, but it's going to be very different this morning. So we will pr- open in prayer. We will remain in prayer because this is an interesting topic. We're going to talk about Jehovah's Witnesses. So uh, I wanted to pray first or start with a knock-knock joke. I couldn't remember which one. Sorry. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for the ability that we have the freedoms in this nation to come together, that this nation does provide freedoms for every cult, every religion, every persuasion out there. But Father, sometimes as a church, we have to understand that you've separated us out. You've called us a people unto yourself and that you want us to be people of the book and this book only. And Father, as we discuss uh, various things this morning, help us to stay on topic Help us understand that these people are are sincere, but they're sincerely misled. Father, help us to maintain a biblical perspective on everything we do within the walls of this church. Again, I thank you for listening ears. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I'm going to reiterate a couple of things this morning a couple of times, so be patient with me. Um, To take any of these things and put it in a one-hour or 45-minute lesson, whatever it ends up being, is really hard. Because you want to say, what does this one believe? What does this one do? Why did it become? And then go through all their um, variances that they went into. And you you just can't do it. There are books written on these things, wonderful books. However, I have printed out a copy of some of the reference materials I've used for this whole thing. Um, not all of them, but some of them. Uh, if you'd like a copy, see me um, afterwards. Uh, d- please don't buy all the books. Some of the books are just so, just so you can get an idea. Because uh, we were doing these classes and I'd put it all together. At the back, you'd have a, a reference list. So this is what you're getting. Because uh, I'm almost done with this series. Thank God. Uh, it's been quite tedious. Uh, so this morning we're going to talk about Jehovah's Witnesses. It actually started that the founder of Jehovah's Witnesses was selling Christmas cards to to raise money. I don't know if you find that ironic, but I do because they don't like to celebrate anything. And the guy that founded it was selling Christmas cards as he was establishing uh, Jehovah's Witness and publishing Christmas cards. So it's kind of interesting. As you can see in the picture, I'm going to go through mostly just slides this morning. Uh, What I want to deal with is some of their uh, theological problems. Um, But however, I want to make make something very clear. They are zealous people. They are very zealous. And sometimes I wish the church was as zealous as they are. Um, They will haunt you if you even have a, a... hint of wanting to believe what they teach. They will haunt you. There's a lady across the street from me who uh, actually let them in the house for a while one day, and every week they show up, and this week I kind of went out and asked them to leave. Um, But at the same time, we need to minister to them and to the people they're trying to get because we have the gospel. And here's another thing I'm going to say. So not only is it tedious to get this into a one-hour session, But the point of most of these is we need to have a clear gospel. Most of these cults and divisive groups and people that have uh, even some denominations, they don't have a clear gospel. They're messed up at the most important place. What's the gospel? Um, So if you get messed up there and then start adding things and making other works more important and raise them above the word of God, and that becomes your authority more than the word of God, there's problems right away. Um, if I was a really good auto mechanic and I thought Kilton's, uh, with Chilton's guide to MGs was more better than the Bible, I'd be quoting, you know, all the parts of, and that's what happens. You have Jehovah's Witness have their, I'm not going to say their Bible, their book, uh, the New World Translation, the Mormons have their book and they elevate those above the word of God. 
Then you have groups that have taken the Word of God and mistranslated it and misapplied it and picked out verses or certain things, and we'll deal with that in the next session. In the next session, we're going to deal with Lutherans and Calvinists. So I'll try to put that in an hour. Uh, so, But as you can see, one of the things Jehovah's Witness uh, teach is that Christ was impaled on a stake. And that's why I put the picture up there, because one of the things you will hear from them is that he didn't go to the cross, he went to the stake. Do you have a problem with that? The cross, the word cross is clearly stated in Scripture. How does the cross become a stake? Um, here's the interesting thing, the name Jehovah uh, Witness. Let's deal with the name first of all. Jehovah's Witness, because it sounds really good. I'm witnessing for what? Jehovah. I'm witnessing for the Lord, but what's the problem with the word Jehovah? And let me kind of explain this to you, and it'll be a little technical, but I want you to grasp this, because when you're dealing with them and talking to them, you could just say, where'd you get your name from? The Masorites who from the 6th century to the 10th century worked to reproduce the original text of the Hebrew Bible, uh, replaced the vowels of the word Yahweh, or Y-H-W-H, known as the Tetragrammaton. Uh, let me go back up for a second. The original Hebrew has no vowel points. I don't know if you understand what vowel points are, but the original Hebrew was all consonants. Okay. Now, I don't know about you all, I can't read something that has no vowels. Right? Because we're used to reading things with vowels. But the Hebrews were so taught and integrated the system of how to make vowel points as you look at something, they never added them. Kind of get what I'm saying? So to make it a readable text, the Masorites, that's why when we talk about our Hebrew text of the Old Testament, most of the time we're referring to the Masoretic text, the one with the vowel points. And here's what they did. They took the vowel points, the vowels of... Adonai, or Elohim, and thus came up with an artificial name. So you can see how they put the vowel points in. Y-E-H-O-W-A-H. And it's probably more of a V sound, Yahweh. So, but, um, and it came into being. So that basically, and if you notice, it's Y-E-H-O-W-A-H. There is no Hebrew letter for Y, uh, for J. There's none. Okay, and that took a transition for another time because this is although Christian scholars after the Renaissance and Reformation periods used the term Jehovah for Yahweh uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries, biblical scholars again began to use the form Yahweh. Uh, early, early Christian writers such as Clement of Alexandria in the second century had used a form of Yah- like Yahweh, and this pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton was never really lost. Other Greek transcripts also indicate that Yahweh should be pronounced Yahweh, like I'm saying it, Yahweh. Um, Basically, it's interesting because the Hebrews don't like to say God's name. So we really don't know what God's name is. So if we say Yahweh is God's name, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that, but it's not Jehovah. A lot of times we'll teach things because for for impact and for understanding, we'll say Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah uh, uh, Jireh, Jehovah, we'll give him the compound name, but that's not really what the Bible says. The Bible does say Yahweh, okay? And his compound names deal with Yahweh or El, um, probably a lesson for another time. But what, what they're starting with, and here's what's happening. If you're building your organization off a of false understanding, you're, you're, you're already skewed. And it's problematic. The word witness is taken from a passage in Isaiah 43, 10, which says, You are my witnesses, saith the Lord. And similar passages also say that. So they put Jehovah, witnesses. Because we are to what? We are to bear witness of him. And I don't have a problem with that part. But, it's, but again, where they, their starting point is problematic. Here's the roots of this. So we get, we've got the name a little bit. The name is... Uh, uh, a name that fit what they were wanted to wanted to do and teach, and it says they were from the Seventh Day Adventists. And next week we'll talk about the Seventh Day Adventists. And I thought about this, and I said maybe I should reverse it. And I go no, because you'll see why. And the Seventh Day Adventists were an offshoot of the Baptists, who were an offshoot of the Reform movement, who were an offshoot of the Lutherans founded by Martin Luther. Um, in other words, so, somebody came from somewhere um, who who wasn't initially intending to be an offshoot of the Roman Catholic Church. And we'll talk about that in the next session. Uh, too many, sometimes I think believers uh, give too much power to Luther and Calvin. Um, and they, they, were, they were very much problematic to start with, too. But if you notice where it's coming from, it's all, there are all some Roman Catholicism in all of these. Uh, and we have to be very leery 
of that influence. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses are the largest of several offshoots, 7.8 million in 2014. Of the Seventh-day Adventists, 18.5 million members as of 2014. So it's, it's basically uh, a split was from the South, South uh, Seventh-day Adventist was in 1879. Again, what I say, the problems with 1800s. A lot of things were problematic at that time. Um, some of the, fo- the founders, um, listen, if you want to understand what a group's like, go to its roots. So its roots were... Uh, we've seen where, where it came from, the Seventh-day Adventists, who already had some problems with uh, Scripture and, and using it to become legalistic. Because if you know anything, Seventh-day Adventists uh, still hold the Sabbath. And if you do that, you become a little legalistic to start with, and then you'll add more legalism into it, and then you just... So the founder, 1852, uh, Charles Taz Russell, 1852-1916, the Watchtower Society traces its origins to Charles Taz Russell. After periods of being a Presbyterian, a Congregationalist, a skeptic, and an Adventist, he organized a Bible study in Pennsylvania in 1870. The group's intense examination of the Bible caused them to reject traditional Christian teaching is on the soul nature of deity and the immortality of the soul. Now, first of all, remember, you have one person rising to the top and leading, and that's also problematic. Um, in 1880, 30 congregations had been formed in seven states, which is fascinating, in 10 years. And you say, that's got to be good, right? Because we as believers sometimes look at what? Numbers. Numbers, quantity, we think it's got to be good if it's going this well. And, it's, and, in, and in 10 years, they have 30 congregations in seven states. That's got to be really good, right? Be very careful of quantity versus quality. Uh, so and we, there wasn't quality here because it wasn't biblically based. Russell founded Zion's Watchtower in 1879. And Zion's Watchtower Tract Society in 1884 later renamed it Watchtower Bible uh, t- and track society, and sometimes you will see these ki- these witnesses leave a magazine called Watchtower and Awake. They're both publications of that. Um, here's the interesting thing. It does have some truth in it. Some truth. But who's going to discern that? And that's the difficulty. That's why we started this whole series, to build discernment. So some truth doesn't make it all the truth. And if it's some truth and some lie, therefore it all becomes a lie. Logic tells you some truth with lie equals a lie and get away from it. It's as easy as that. Um, And again, not only are roots bad, but their gospel's horrific. And their understanding of a lot of the Bible is just horrific. Um, Zion's Watchtower Bible and Tract Society was incorporated in 1884, and in 1896 it dropped the word Zion from its name. In addition to his speaking and editorial work, Russell wrote six volumes titled Studies in Scripture, originally Millennial Dawn, which appeared between 1886 and 1904. By the time of his death in 1916, the legal and doctrinal foundation of the society had been established. So Charles Taz Russell is the founder. And again, this is just... Very basic stuff. Judge Joseph Franklin Rutherford was also involved after Russell's uh, death in 1916. The Watchtower Society's lawyer, Judge Joseph Franklin Rutherford, took over as presidency in 1931. The societies uh, became known as Jehovah's Witnesses. Under Rutherford's leadership, the organization began to experience phenomenal growth. In 1928, the organization had 44,000 members, and by his death... In 1942, the membership had grown 115,000. Part of this growth can be attributed to Rutherford's insistence that the world was about to end and Armageddon would happen any day. Um, You know, and and we're going to deal with some of this stuff. Um, You're scared to death out of people, they'll come. Um, And at this, again, at this particular time, look at what was happening during this, this time frame. We had World War I. We were starting World War II. Uh, it was very tr- tr- uh, troublesome and t- turbulent times, and people were looking for answers. You know, and uh, Nathan H. Knorr, 
uh, Rutherford's death in 42, Nathan uh, Knorr was elected as the third president, and he remained president until his death in 42. That's wrong. I, I, somewhere I did, um, he could, they both couldn't die at the same time. Under his leadership, the Watchtower Society greatly increased its publication work. This included the publication of the New World Translation of the Bible. This translation, published in six volumes between 50 and six, 1960, supports many Jehovah's Witness doctrines while ignoring accepted rules of language translation. And that's what you've got to be very careful of. Um, you don't really have to be a Greek scholar to know they're wrong. Uh, you just see certain things they're doing to, again, promote their doctrine. And when you take a Bible, and we'll go do some comparisons in a few minutes here, and see what they did, all you have to do is change a few words, and, you, and it, it will greatly increase your membership sometimes, but greatly increase your error. Um, then you've got to ask yourselves, are they leading people to the Lord, which they're really not. They're getting numbers and getting people indoctrinated. When Nor took over leadership of the witness, he had 115,000 members by his death in 77. Uh, he had two, point, uh, two and a quarter million people. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, again, if you look at it, um, part of their things that they do to attract people is they build really lovely facilities. Jeho- uh, their kingdom halls are really some really good facilities, and they do something we lack sometimes. Uh, what, what they do is give people the ability to want to come to be taught. Um, maybe that's the wrong word, giving them the ability. But they come. They're indoctrinated. They take classes. Uh, they, they learn uh, their, uh, this is going to be a bad word to be using, but their catechism. They can uh, tell what they are to believe and why they are believing it. And they take people out, what? They take one leader and a couple of his little fledgling uh, followers, and he, they teach them very intensely. Uh, F- Fr- uh, Frederick W. France was, his ni- it was the 1958 Convention of Witnesses when he addressed an audience of tw- 250,000 people from 123 different countries at Yankee Stadium and the Polo Grounds. So it was greatly growing um, again, and this is what we see that the, the, going on. Here's what's happening. What do we consider our book? The Bible. Solely our book, right? We want to be people of the Bible. We want to, when I first got here, I think one of the things I said, and, I'm, and I will always try to say this, I don't say I'm this or that or this. I want to be biblical. We want to be biblical. What does the Bible say? And um, if you overemphasize any doctrine, you're gonna, this is going to be problematic. And here's these people. They overemphasize not the Bible, but their book. Their New World Translation in 1961, the Jehovah's Witness published their own English version of the Bible, calling it the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. The New World Translation is described by the witnesses as a translation of the Holy Scriptures made directly from the Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, into modern-day English by a committee of anointed witnesses of Jehovah. Now, that really sounds good. But I don't consider myself, by far, any kind of a Greek or Hebrew scholar, and they have lots of mistakes. And if they had a group of scholars doing this, why would they not see the simplest of mistakes? Um, However, and we'll go through, again, we'll go through it. However, it has been heavily criticized for distorting some of the original Hebrew and Greek texts in order to, to more suitably reflect, the, uh, again, the Watchtower Society's theology. According to David Reed, an ex-witness, the New World Translation came into being for the sole purpose of supporting Watchtower doctrines. That makes sense, doesn't it? Reed said during the 50s, Watchtower leaders went beyond interpretation by producing their own version of the Bible, with hundreds of verses changed to fit Watchtower doctrine. And their New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures continues to be rewritten every few years with additional changes made to bring God's Word into closer agreement with the organization's teaching. That is taking a square peg and making it fit a round hole. Okay. Now, you're going to, and many of you will say and can say that, well, we get different translations all the time of our Bible from different scholars. I mean, um, I'm using a 1975, I think it is. My year may be wrong. New American Standard. They did an update in 1995. 
And you say, well, what was the difference? They took the deeds and thous out of there. People find that very old. So instead of these and thous, they, ch- they changed it to normal pronouns. Um, and there was a few other changes. We, we had the King James. King James was what year? Anybody know? This is a test. Huh? First one was printed, believe it or not, 1603. We are based, our King James is based off the 1611. So they had to update that because I have a 1611 in my office. And if you want to have some fun one day, try and read it. It's written in English, but, huh? No, no, really old English. Really old English. I don't even think the old English can read it. Um, But again, scholars worked on that. And they did with the King James, for instance. It's very interesting. It's just offshoot. King James gave him a uh, table of how he wanted to translate. He gave a guide to translation on it. So you've got to be very careful because King James was what? What was his background persuasion? Good luck. He was all over the way. What? He was Church of England, but he was fighting the Catholics. So what he wanted to do is make a version that was available to the people that would be basically kind of an anti-Catholic persuasion, um, which is fine. But he held some of the understandings in there. Uh, And that's something for another time. But we have our word church today because of King James. He wouldn't get rid of it. And if you ever did the translation of the word ecclesia, it's not even close to the word church. So we say, hey, we're in church. Where'd you get the word? So we have to go back to find out where. And that's for another time. But our translations hold true to the Greek much differently than theirs do. Theirs are holding true to a doctrinal persuasion. Imagine if we did. What if we had a, a Bible you know, for Lutherans only, another Bible for Presbyterians, another for Baptists, another for what? You know, everybody has, because they all have different doctrinal persuasions, right? Um, but here's some examples of mistranslations. The New World Translation of Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth proved to be formless and waste, and there was darkness upon the face of the watery deep, and God's active force was moving to and fro over the surface of the waters. This translation ties in with the Watchtower Tract Society's denial of the Holy Spirit is alive and the third person of the Trinity. Now, just think about this for a minute. Could, just, just for sake of thought, could, could that have been something from Star Wars? May the Force be with you. And people say, don't watch Star Wars because it's what? It's not biblical, and it's denying God. Well, that's denying God because it says God's active force, where ours says, and it clearly says in the Hebrew, the Spirit, the Ruach of God, was moving over the face, surface of the waters. Now, how did they erase that word? They said God's active force. So they, they're translating it to fit their doctrine. And John 1.1, 1, 1. turn to John 1.1. 1, 1. I want you to see this because this is the fun one. Turn to it because I want you to see it in your Bible. Well, I'm sorry, what? Okay, we'll do that. We're, we're going to see this. I want you to see this. Okay. Now, remember, in our Bibles, we're taking it off the Greek text. The Greek text is not, there is no capitals. In the original Greek text, it's all lowercase. Greek text is lowercase. Okay? And sometimes you have to do what we call making a, tr- a, tr- a translation decision. Is something, like for instance, you're doing spirit. Is it human spirit or Holy Spirit? And you have to make a translation decision based on the context to say, should we capitalize it to make it in our minds now Holy Spirit or lowercase, and now we're thinking it's human spirit. Okay? Um, So there's translation decisions that have to be made to to answer part of your question. The other part is this. Here's what the New World Translation says. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. God. Now, look at your version. I want you to look clearly. I know it's here, but I want you to see it. It says, in the beginning was the Word. That's a translation decision to make it capital because we're reflecting that the Word was who? It would be, it would be Jesus Christ coming in the flesh because we see in 114, it's based off of 114 what that Word was. The Word was, it says the Word became flesh, so that's got to be Jesus Christ. So the Word in the beginning was God. And the Word was God. Okay? 
It says here the word was a God because here's what they did. They added an article. Now, we have two articles in English. Well, three. A, an, and the. Three articles. Okay? We use an with vowels. We all know this. A is, so a and an are the same thing. Right? So if you think you could be a God and Jesus was just put on flesh and became a God and you could be like Jesus, you can become a God, a God fits better. And there is no problem doing that in the Greek, translating it to English. Listen to me, there's no problem with that, because we want it to read right. You understand? So a lot of times you'll see the word A in your Bible. And you say, is it right or wrong? You can cross it out, because there's no such thing as the word A or an in the Greek. A and an does not have that word. So we're discussing it with them, and we could say, the word's not there. Why would we take something and change the context of that verse? The verse and the whole passage of John chapter 1 is all about Jesus Christ, who he was, which is interesting because this is what you got to do. It says in the beginning, look at your text, it says in the beginning was the word. Was is a very interesting word there. Because what it says is an ongoing event in the past. Now how do you say something was ongoing in the past? So I say this, in the beginning the word was, wasing with God. He always was, was he? There wasn't a time he wasn't, was he? Was he? And that's, that's exactly what that word's saying there. So we say Jesus was, in his pre-incarnate state, he was God. When he became flesh, he was God in flesh. You can't do that. So they added something because they want you to think you can be that. The word A is not there. And we have to make a translation decision. Is it keeping the context? So it has, to be, it has to be uppercase G, no article. If we make it lowercase G and put an article in, we can sell that from the Greek language. We cannot sell that from the context. Do you understand the difference? Okay, because, for instance, I'll go, I say to somebody here, go get a book out of my library. Now, if you've been to my library, you would say, the first question should be, what book? Because a book means what? Any book that's in there. Prayerfully, if I say to you, go get the book, you're going to go come back and bring back the Bible. Okay? So what we ha- that's why the Greek is very specific. It says the, it's being very case specific. When it doesn't have an article, it's general. But then you have to go to context to understand what it is. And John, John's very solid, giving you a whole context. John's book is a commentary about Jesus Christ. As easy as that. Um, I, I don't know if you can read this. It's a lot. I tried to slam it into one slide. So, New World Translation of Colossians 1, 16 and 17. says, Because by means of him, all other things were created in heavens and upon earth, the, vis- the things visible and the things invisible, no matter whether they are thrones or lords, ships or governments or authorities, all other things have been created through him and for him. Also, he is before all other things, and by by means of him, all other things were made to, uh, that were made to exist. In the New World Translation, the word other is in brackets. This is, a correct, this is a correct admission that the word other does not appear in the original Greek. However, if Paul wanted to teach that Jesus was another created thing, there were two perfect suitable Greek words, alos and heteros, which he could have used. But he used neither word. See, what they're trying to say is Jesus was a created being. That he wasn't God. Um, and, and again, part of their salesmanship is you can become like Jesus. Uh, we should be Christ-like. We can't become Jesus. Uh, then it goes on to say, but neither word is used. There is no other word. There is no word for other in the Greek. The only reason for adding the word other would be to support the idea that Jesus is a created being and not God. Jehovah's Witnesses teach that God created Jesus, then Jesus created everything else. The translation given in the New International Version is that is for by Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or dominions. All things were created by by him and for him, he is before all things, and in him all things are held together. Which is a fantastic set of verses. And when you change that, um, 
to suit your doctrinal slant, um, what you're basically saying is the authority of the Bible only is good as if it holds to what I believe. And be very careful of that. Uh, let's go through some Jehovah Witnesses' beliefs. Um, and this is, wow, how did that happen? Okay. Um, what we'll do is go through these one by one, but one, one way to understand how different the doctrinal system of Jehovah's Witnesses is from that of the Orthodox Christianity, and I use that bracketed. In other words, Orthodox Christianity is what we would be in, okay? Uh, is, to, is to see what is denied. The doctrinal teaching of Jehovah Witness includes the following, and this is so important because these are the kind of things you say, what do you believe in? And we would call this the foundational understandings to our faith. This is what they deny. They deny the Trinity. They deny the deity of Christ. They deny the personality of the Holy Spirit. So basically what they're saying is what? There's, they're being monotheistic in a very slanted way. Um, they only believe God, not Jesus Christ, not a Holy Spirit. Um, then the biblical view of the atonement, which again, that holds part of what we teach as part of our gospel. They, uh, they deny the bodily resurrection of Christ. They deny the salvation by faith in Christ alone. And they deny, at the bottom one says, denial of salvation outside of their organization. So if you walk up to one of them and they say, and it's real interesting because I've had many a conversation. I worked with a guy for many years that was a leader in one of his, not a, not the pastor, but he was a leader, in, core leader in one of his kingdom halls. And he, and I kept getting him back to the basics. Their, their understanding and how to interpret everything is so skewed, you have no idea. And they're so indoctrinated into it to say, here, let's go back to hear what the Bible says. Uh, they, don't, they just don't see it. Uh, and that's how Satan works. I want to tell you something. Satan, Satan will take this, God's word, and people will so twist it, they can't see the truth. They're, Satan blinds their eyes. And we've got to pray, first of all, that, that, we, uh, that they at least give a hearing to the word. Uh, Here's what they believe, the Godhead or Trinity. Jehovah's Witness teach that there is no Trinity. Orthodox Christians do not, do not claim to understand the mystery of the Trinity. But when they study the New Testament, they come to the inescapable conclusion that it teaches that there are three eternal persons existing in what, as one God, as the one God. Again, um, the word Trinity doesn't appear in our Bible. And I don't even like that word sometimes. I like to say the triune God, God existing in three essences, all having the same attributes. And if you ever did a study, you say, well, here's an attribute of Jesus. Can, we, can God the Father, God the Son have those attributes? Yes. Yet at the same time, they're distinctly different. We gave that chart. I think I've got it in one of these lessons again today that a few of you asked for. The chart that distinguishes the three, yet the three are still one. And you say, well, I don't get it. Well, neither do I. Neither do I. It's, 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 listen, God is complex. You think to understand totality of God, just 66 books are enough? I think John said it very eloquently in John chapter, just go for a second. This is how we understand God. Well, just, just Jesus himself, um, if I can find the verse. Um, uh, yeah. 21:25. Thank you. Uh, the, he, at the very end of his book, John says this, and there are also many other things which Jesus did. Now, this is just Jesus' life on earth. He did so many other things. If they were written in detail, written down in detail, I suppose that he, not even the world itself would not contain the books that were written. It, that means that's a massive amount of things Jesus did when? How many years? Because most of his life that's detailed is what? Three years. Three years. Would, did, was John talking about his whole life? Probably. But his whole life, wouldn't the, the world couldn't contain the books. Imagine if we wanted to explain who God is. How would we do that? You know, um, and I'd say, let's stay biblical. Here's what the Bible teaches. Here's what the Bible teaches. Here's what the Bible teaches. We don't have to put it together and say, hey, I got it all. Sometimes there's, you've got to look at think of it like parallel lines going all the way into heaven. When you get there, they meet. And we have an eternity to do what? To grasp it. I think that's a fair amount of time. How can you grasp God? Well, you got eternity. Will you grasp God? Well, it's eternity. You figure that out. Um, 
But what they want to do is eliminate the things that they, they can't grasp to make things graspable um, and to deny the, the totality of the Word of God. That's what it comes down to. Remember, we started this series on the authority and significance of Scripture. We can't do anything to harm that. Um, here's what, they, here's what the, about the Father. The Jehovah's Witness teaches that the Father is Almighty God. He's not part of the Trinity. His personal name is Jehovah, and he should be addressed by that name. Prayer and worship should be directed to the Father. He is not omniscient or, or, or omnipresent. Now, I don't know how many issues you have. <laughs> but here's the number one issue I have. If you go in the Old Testament and you look through every occurrence of Yahweh, a lot of them have to do with Jesus Christ. It refers to the second person of the Trinity, not the first person. Not all of them, but there are places you could see that it's referring to Jesus Christ. Uh, so we got a problem with that. Second of all, I got a problem. He, God the Father is not omniscient. There's something beyond God's knowing. I don't know. I just God's and and um, one of the things I teach young believers is please don't pray for the presence of God. God's present everywhere all the time. Um, uh, you don't need a cop in your rearview mirror to drive better. Just know God's on board. You know, I love that. You, you remember that license plate that came out years ago? God is my what? Co-pilot? No, he's not. He's the pilot, right? <laughs> That's what we should be saying. Uh, but don't let go of the wheel. Just kind of just acknowledge what God the Father is and who he is. And when you do this, you den- by denying and diminishing who God is, you're making the God fit so you won't have any uh, anything to be guilty of or repent of and, and, and it Again, it's part of the salesmanship of Jehovah's Witness are good salesmen. I don't know if you know that. Um, and, and again, they touch on the truth. Here's what they say about Jesus. Now, Jehovah's Witness, Witness believe that Jesus Christ is the only one of many gods and his created being. Now, if you just say that, what does that become? Isn't that idolatrous in your mind? I'm just, what is, what is idolatry? You know, uh, they translate again. We've already done John one one. Uh, only Jehovah, um, only Jehovah is worthy of worship, and to worship Jesus is unscriptural. Compare this with John five twenty three that that says that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. I'm not. I don't know. I, and I'll be honest with you. I I I, do, I thought I had one. I do not own. And please don't get me one. I do not own a New World Translation. It's bad enough I got a Mormon Bible, but um, I don't own one. And I'll be honest, I don't think I've really even read one. I know the guy at work, he still always show me stuff, and I just show him stuff in the Bible. Let's get back to the book. You go to your book, I go to my book. Your book's wrong. Um, my book. When, when on earth, when Jesus was on earth, he, he, was, he was perfect, sinless man, nothing more, nothing less. The problem I have with that. If that's true, there was no need of redemption for anyone else because we could do the same thing. Do you understand that? Uh, he's just a man. Now, the other problem that does is does what? It denies what? The sin nature, doesn't it? Because if we were all born in sin, right? It denies he was born. Um, I'm not sure. Probably not. Um, probably Mary had some, I don't know. There's so many theories out there. Right. Well, they contradict a lot of things, believe me. Um, Jesus is God's agent for establishing the theocracy, God's kingdom on earth. Remember, kingdom halls for God's kingdom on earth. Where's he going to come? The one of the halls or all the halls? But it's kingdom halls. Uh, his ransom paid for Adam's sin alone. Listen. He came and died for Adam's sin alone. This gives people the opportunity to earn their salvation by believing God and doing good works. Problematic. Uh, Now, this is kind of an open... You should not pray to Jesus. I'm kind of a believer. You shouldn't pray just to Jesus. You should pray to God. Uh, God includes them all. Some people pray to the Father because they go after the model that Jesus gave in the Gospels. Uh, Our Father who art in heaven, pray to God the Father. Um, I don't necessarily have a... a, a, Anytime a formula is 
built in. It's wrong. Um, even, oh, but it's got to be closed in Jesus' name. It's like signing a letter. Amen. Um, I, I have a problem with that because I don't see that in Scripture all the time. It says, just pray in Jesus' name. In other words, in who he is, in the totality of that. But what they basically say, don't pray. Jesus has nothing to do with prayer and reaching anything or through Jesus or as a mediator. Because the next one, Jesus is the mediator only for an anointed remnant. Uh, and their anointed remnant is 144,000. He's not the mediator for all men. Which is kind of scary because you want to become a Jehovah's Witness. God's only coming to save 144,000. What if you're 144,001? That's your number. You say, why am I in this? Let's go somewhere else. You know, I, I'm, they already got 144,000. You saw the numbers, how they escalated the first you know, 50, 60 years. You're, you're really not in the number by then. Uh, but uh, Christ died on a stake. I already showed you that. Not a cross. And I, and I don't think the cross was this, personally. I think it was this. I know it's a pet thing, because if Jesus carried this, I don't think he would have made it. It's, there were pretty large beams. He had to probably carry the top piece. Uh, but it, it, regardless, it's not, it's not a stake. Um, changing things, again, to, here's about the resurrection of Jesus, because I'm trying to go through the denials. The Watchtower Organization denies the physical resurrection of Jesus, teaching that Jesus did not rise from the dead in the body. He died in... Uh, that he died in, he came back, Jesus' body was supposedly dissolved into the gases in the tomb, and he was raised as Michael the archangel, who was a spirit creature without a physical body. After Jesus' resurrection, God generated bodies to appear to the disciples. These bodies even included nail holes. Now, this is just sci-fi. What is that channel called? FX. Uh, basically what they do, and think of any scriptures you have to just totally just deny. Just deny. Um, and not only that, why Michael? Yeah, you know, I mean, it could have been Gabriel. It could have been anybody. Um, the Holy Spirit. Jehovah's Witness teach that the Holy Spirit is not God, but in... What, oh, I'm sorry. Go, go. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Honestly, I, I don't have a translation of it, but again, that's a good thing to look up. But there, I'm telling you. This is, this is why, this is a good question. Um, oh, okay, yeah, kind of say, say it louder so they can hear it in the back if you don't mind. Go ahead. Do you understand the question? When, when Jude is referring back to the time of Moses that Michael the archangel was involved in that, and if Michael the archangel was only Jesus after the resurrection, how could he be way, way earlier? How did they interpret that verse? And I think they just say, well, he, the various times, this is my understanding, various times different people use Michael's, what would that be? Michael's spirit? Mike, the avatar of Michael. I don't know what else to come up with. <laughs> because that's kind of what it is, if you kind of think of it. If he filled that spirit creature, um, that's kind of, isn't that kind of the idea of an avatar? Um, from what we studied that from Hinduism, right? So, so and, and, don't, and, and not, don't go to James Cameron. <laughs> um, but it's a good question. And I think, what, what, again, what happens is, when most of these cults, they build things to get people involved in it, in, and just infatuated with these people know, because they, they get a, a higher understanding of the, of the Bible and, and God's Word. And that's, what, that's really dangerous. Um, I, I, again, we're referring back to Roman Catholicism. They didn't want the Bible in people's hands. You know why? They, they fought that. 
because they wanted to be the ones that were interpreting. They wanted to be the ones that held the interpretation of the Word of God. So if you hold that interpretation, people want to know. They want People have a God consciousness. They want to be filled with an understanding of God. So if you have that higher understanding and deeper and more spiritual life, people want to say, oh, I want that too. And people do necessarily. I mean, it's, it's just human nature that God's built into us. When we see somebody that seems more spiritual, we want, man, what am I missing? I want what they have. So that's just kind of the draw to this kind of thing. Um, so if you have, we have an understanding that they're wrong. And, and ours seems higher and better. And you could be like God. Wouldn't, what is that? Isn't that, isn't that Bible? Didn't the Bible talk they wanted to be like God? And what did, what did God do to them? God judged them for wanting to be like God. Well, Tower of Babel, what was that about? Remember what that was? They wanted the top to reach God so they could be like God. And God did what? Confounded the languages at the time. Holy Spirit. Now, I hope I'm don't, I don't think I can answer all these questions, but they're good questions. Um, but I'm not going to do research because that requires me to go to that Bible. <laughs> I'm done. When I'm done at enough seven, ten minutes, that's it. No more. And if they knock on my door, we'll, we'll, I'll talk to them. But, or if they come in my street, I... I was standing outside yesterday when they pulled up and I was getting ready for baseball. So I thought I'd grab all my bats that I don't take to baseball and just stand there. <laughs> Let him think. Jehovah's Witness believe, teach that the Holy Spirit is not God, but invisible active force. Um, because the word does translate wind. Pneuma means wind. Uh, like the wind or electricity. Orthodox Christians believe that the Holy Spirit is God and has the same divine nature as the Father and the Son. John 16, 7 and verse 13, the Holy Spirit is called our teacher and our comforter. And what's interesting, when John talks about, and when Jesus talks about God sending another, another, that means another sending, when Jesus would go, he would send another, it was like him. That would be another, then that's where the word other is used. Um, another, or it would be another, but it was another like him. Um, Hebrews, while well, Hebrews 10, 29 and Ephesians 4, 30 teach that he can be insulted, outraged, grieved, and so on and so forth. Um, I know there's, there are some Bibles out there to call the Holy Spirit an it, because that's not true. That's not a good use of it. Again, the Holy Spirit is a he. Um, the Bible, Jehovah's Witness teach, and this is where to go. The Jehovah's Witness teach that the inspired word of God, uh, the Bible is the inspired word of God, but it is their version of the Bible. It is also th- thought to be a closed book to all but the remnant. In other words, it's our translation and only those special few can grasp it. And that, that's when you get people in because I want to know what it says. Well, you can only go to their classes and their people and they'll tell you what it means. Otherwise, you cannot get it. And the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says, seek God and you shall find him. Uh, and how do you seek him? Through the Bible, through his word. It was meant for the people. Well, here's the interesting thing. Hebrew was a very common language. Everybody knew it at that time. That was he, the Hebrew and it was easily to uh, be taught. Greek was, there was different kinds of Greek. It was Koine Greek, which was basically the common language, street language. Not our street language today, because some people want to take the New Testament and make it in the street language. It's not that kind of street language. It was common language. It wasn't a classical style of teaching. And we could be more classical in our language too, can't we? Can't we teach people a little class the way they talk? Like, is that a proper word to use, or can you use another word? You want to know people's street language... Go out to the baseball field. And and you'll hear me saying, is there not a better word for that? (laughs) But here's what happens. When they say that there's a special group of people that can do this and and can understand it if studied in combination with the books put out by the uh, Watchtower Society, they say we all need help to understand the Bible and we can't find the scriptural guidance. We need outside uh, the faithful and discreet slave organization. Uh, Here's, here's the interesting thing is, if you want to understand the Bible, I'm going to tell you this real easy. I'm going to give you the easiest formula. Read it. Read it. How many times somebody's walked up to me and said, I don't understand what this verse is? Well, I go, well, go back to this verse. Well, go back to this. And that's why we use, here's what it says in the New Testament. Let's go back to the Old Testament. The Old Testament was the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. They work together. 
So some people will say, you know, I've read John over 30 times. I don't understand what it's saying. Well, how much else have you read? No, just John. You're reading like, it's like taking a novel, a huge novel, and say, I've only read chapter 38 50 times. What about the other? No, just 38. It's a great chapter, but I don't understand it. Well, why don't you read the rest of the book? You ever think of that? And, um, and we don't. We don't. It's, it's, we want people to tell us. You know, the hardest thing I've, no, I've learned as a pastor is when people come up to me and I say, here's, here's a way to learn it, and I give them an assignment instead of telling them what, they mean, what it means, they won't do it. They just want me to tell them. And then what if I do? I'm telling them what? My understanding of that verse. Which is fine. I'm pastor. But you're supposed to do what? Be Bereans and what? Check me out. If I am, if I am without fault, we have issues. <laughs> we have issues. Know thyself. Uh, here's what else it says. Is that, As a faithful and discreet slave, witnesses claim that the only the Watchtower Society is capable of rightly understanding God's word. Only this organization fun- functions for Jehovah's purpose and to his praise. To it alone, God's sacred word, the Bible, is, no, is not a, a sealed book. So that's how you get people in. That's what you sell them with. You want to understand God's book, you've got to come to us. We've got the keys. We've got the keys because we've got the kingdom. Um, kind of idea. Um, and that's taken right from Watchtower, 1973, pages 402. Um, heaven and hell. Only 144,000 people go to heaven. There is no hell. Good luck with that. <laughs> uh, um, listen, there, there is only one way, only one way through Jesus Christ. There's only one way. Um, if you don't have that, I don't care if you're the 144,000. You'll find out that there is a hell. I had a chance to share the gospel with a kid yesterday because he said, man, it's hot as, it was really bad. It was like 3.30 and it, were, it was getting, anyway, he says, I, I said, son, this is, this is just a pretest. You know, if you don't have Jesus, you go in there and it's going to be a lot hotter and there's no water breaks. He says, what? So we had a good time. He still looked at me like a deer caught in headlights. But uh, anointed remnant, the anointed, <clears throat> excuse me, the anointed remnant are those 144,000 who are still alive, most of whom were born in 1914 or earlier. Now, I'm going to explain this to you because it's interesting. They kept giving dates. First date was 1914, uh, that, that Jesus would come back, and there are about 8,000 left alive. The remnant that have died and gone to heaven guide the work of Jehovah's Witnesses here on earth. So those that have died are now the guidance system over. Now, here's what happened. In 1914, they said, this generation shall not pass away. That's what was given out in their, their Jehovah's Watchtower magazine. Now, I was looking forward to 1975 for a totally different reason. They were looking to 1975 because 1914, that generation passed away most, mostly that they were talking about. So they gave a new date, 1975. They were looking for Christ to come in 1975. I was looking to get my diploma to get out of high school. Um, I got my diploma. They didn't get Christ to come back. Here's the interesting thing here. All goals and activities are directed from the Watchtower Society are directed to the second coming of Christ, which will be followed by Armageddon in the setting of, up of God's kingdom on earth. 1914, first date set. Early on, Jehovah's Witnesses taught the second coming would take place in October 1914. When that didn't happen, they changed the prophecy in their books. Right? Uh, to explain it away, they changed the definition of the word in the Bible that talks about Christ coming on, uh, to mean Christ's invisible presence. Voila! After all, it is difficult to disprove Christ's invisible presence did not come and take place in 1914. Jesus, however, said, For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming, the parousa, of the Son of Man. Thus, all nations will see his coming. It's not invisible. So 1918 comes along, and in 1918, they taught that, 19, it'll be, they taught that the second coming would occur in 1918, because it didn't come in 1914, it didn't come in 1918. So 1920, they thought it would occur in 1920. Didn't happen. 1925, they changed it to 1925. In the early 1920s, Jehovah's Witness distributed a book called Man is Now Living, Will Never Die. It, 
It was prophesied the year 1925 as a date definitely and clearly marked in Scripture even more clearly than that of 1914, which didn't happen. We may confidently expect that 1925 will mark the return of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the faithful prophets of old to, con- to the condition of human perfection. 1925 came and it didn't happen, so they changed it 1941 to 1941. And that didn't happen. 1975, they changed it again. They, no, they changed it in 1941 to 1975, saying there is no longer a date for, uh, to what's happening in 1975 that we showed. But in 1975, since it didn't come, they no longer set dates and times, but analyze the signs in the times. Pfft. To get to this, and I really want to finish in this, so give me two minutes. Uh, salvation. In February 15th, 83, issue of Watchtower identifies four requirements for salvation. You must take in an accurate knowledge of Jehovah and his son, Jesus. I don't know what that means. When do you know you've had an accurate knowledge? It's when they tell you. You must obey God's laws. Which ones? And to which extent? And who judges this? Just think about it for a minute. Who judges this? You must be associated with God's channel, his visible earthly organization. So God's channeling to reach man is through Jehovah's Witness society. If you're not, you know, some people say you got to be a member of this church to be saved. That's the same thing they're saying. You got to be a member of this organization to reach salvation. You must loyally advocate his kingdom rule to others, primarily through door-to-door witnessing. So part of their salvation is you got to, Go get more what? Jehovah's Witnesses. Produce more. Problem is, you notice with those first four requirements, none of them are biblical. There's not a biblical requirement there. And more. Yeah, they're all based on what we can do. But, pardon me? It's not even works-based salvation. The reason I'm just going to say that, I, I, I based on these, you know, I'm not... It's not even workspace because there's no Bible there to say these are the works. It's, this is man-oriented totally about what man says you've got to do. And if you notice, there's nothing here that's biblical. There are biblical verses you could put in there if you want a, a misunderstanding of a workspace salvation. And we'll look at that probably next class or the class after that because they do use the Bible mistranslated and misapplied to what your salvation is. Listen, very simply, believe on Jesus Christ alone period nothing added and i was told this a long time ago the the way is narrow to christ that's what it says in matthew 7 right think of it as going through this going into the subway and you know those turnstile little things you try to take everything with you everything you've ever done you're going to go through that turnstile because god approves of everything you've done can you get through that turnstile you can't get through it the turnstile is christ come to me through me and get to get salvation alone Man, it's so hard for people to understand to get you the heck out of the formula. Uh, and this is just another heretical teaching. But, he, but what I'm saying is the, the idea of salvation, there is zero Bible in that. They're not using their Bible. They're not using your Bible. They're not using any biblical information. How many verses do we, excuse me, do we have that refer to salvation is through Christ alone? Look, just real so quickly. John chapter 5. Go to John chapter 5. Now remember, Jesus is speaking. He had not gone to the cross yet. Okay? He had not died on the cross. But he's saying in John chapter 5, verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word... Here's my word, and believes him who sent me has, that present tense verb means not only has, but will always have, eternal life, and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. What's the only thing in there that gains you this is belief. Period. You can't do it. You can't add anything to that verse to something you've done. That's one, right? Simplistically, it's believe. What were the disciples doing at the time? They were believing Christ. 
And at times they had doubt, but they believed who he was. They just didn't understand, for instance, his death, burial, and resurrection. They had un- they did, and when it happened, they said, oh, this is what he taught. Now we get it. Peter's a great example of that. Read Peter. He got it. So, anyway, um, there's no way to close this. Let's just move on. <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this time. Again, uh, dealing with cults, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to in, encapsulate everything they have, but mostly this is what they don't have. They don't have a salvation in Christ alone through faith alone. They don't have an understanding of the very words that you've given to man so that man can understand the plan you ha- and purpose you have for us. Father, we thank you that we stand on the authority of God, your word alone. In Jesus' name, amen.